Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Andre the Beast Show. Today is going to be, once again, a great show. We have in our show, let me give a better intro for this, this beautiful lady. She's from a little small town outside of uh, Columbus, London, Ohio. Um, didn't grow up with a lot. Mother, single mother, uh, six kids. Uh, was definitely seen hard times, but was truly rich at heart. Family values were clearly important. Reading books in her spare time really is what kept her going. But there was even a bigger part of her life. She really wanted to make impacts on a, a major impact on everybody growing up, even into her adulthood. Being the first to graduate from out of her family in college. Uh, Jesus, the list goes on. And you know the tripped out part about this is she's always interviewing other people and talking about other people. But I'm putting her on the spot with her own. What's your story on her website? We have in the studio today. We're not in the studio, but via Zoom. Somebody's going to tell her story to you and me without further delay former newscaster, WTHR Channel 13, Channel 6, Dallas, the list goes on, Miss Angela Kane. Welcome to the show, Angela. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is so hard for me because you know I'm the questioner. I do not tell my story. Well, but the, I appreciate you taking the time and having an interest in having me share it. You know, thank you, Andre. No problem. You know, I, I remember when you first came to me as a client and I was just like in awe, I was like, oh my God. And I, you don't remember this, but when you came, the air was out, the air conditioner had broke and I was so embarrassed. And I was like, uh, oh my God, the air conditioner. I grew up without air conditioning, no big deal. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, all that I could think about was what is she gonna go and tell everybody? He has no air in the studio. <laughs> but you was a definitely good client. But today we're gonna talk about a lot more than than what you didn't grow up with, but more how the fact that things that you didn't have, the struggles that you dealt with as a as a child, being the first out of six to go to to go to college, um, the impact you had on your on your mother, the foundations that you laid for your brothers and your sisters uh, moving forward. Um, London, Ohio. Tell me a little bit about this little girl and how she got to be where she's at. Boy, I was the quiet one of six kids, so it's still a, a, a shock to me, to tell you the truth. But I am um, London, Ohio, little town, about 7,000 at the time. It's grown now. It has more of a, a, it's more of a bedroom community to Columbus, Ohio, but it's close to Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And I grew up with a lot of love, and I'm still trying to figure out where to look. I don't know how to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, do I look at myself? This is weird. I'm used to asking the questions on things. Hey, it's a different but, ball game now. You're on the B show. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just going to say, no, I, I really did grow up with a lot of love. You know, we didn't have a lot of stuff, but we had each other. And that's right. the way mom raised us. And we had our faith. And there were five girls, one boy. And we were, even to this day, my, my sisters and my mother, they're my best friends. You know, we just have always had each other's back, even through the ups and downs. And we had a, a, a kind of disruptive childhood. My father and mother divorced and, and my mother was the breadwinner and it was hard and she was barely making ends meet in that little town of London. But you know what? What I thought was so beautiful is the faith that we had, the church would always help. She would tell mm -hmm. us when we were older that the church, churches poured into us and poured into other families to help her make ends meet, to help her give us opportunities here and there to join the the Girl Scouts and different things such as that that she couldn't have afforded herself. And then because we were low poverty level, we were able to start working. I got my first job when I was 14 years old. And what was that so first? What was your first job? Working. What was your first job? My first job, I was working for the uh, well, it's Madison County Welfare Department. Oh, they hired wow. me to be a receptionist at okay. the front desk. Okay. This is how naive and, and small town I was. They sat something up on the desk that I didn't have a clue what it was. It was a contraption and they gave me 300 <laughs> envelopes to, to seal. Okay. I literally licked 
300 envelopes. Oh, <laughs> my God. They came, <laughs> the time they came back to me, my tongue was so thick. I thought, fuck, I'm like, this to come and get the envelope. They're like, what, what's wrong? And I said, I look like this. Uh, yeah. That thing they sat beside me was, uh, it had water with a wheel. I was supposed to be taking the, the, the envelopes wheel. across there. I was 14 years old. I'd never been in an office before. <laughs> I was supposed to use the water roller. <laughs> right, right, right. Feel all those envelopes, but it just tells you how much I will go above and beyond to get the job, job done. <laughs> you know, you 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 mentioned you mentioned the um, the separation of your of your ma your mother and father, but you are the youngest of the six. No, no, I was the fourth born. The fourth I was born. The fourth born. Yeah, Who? but there were six of us, um, and we were all born in about seven and a half years. So imagine being a single mother through a chunk of that, or even in my dad. I mean, I love him, but he was just in and out of our lives, and so she had a lot of, a lot of work to do with all these children. Who you did know, you lean on the most? Own. Who did you lean on the most, or who was? Out of your out of your siblings, who was the one that you gravitated to more? Did you basically say you saw what was going on and you decide, you know, you're going to just do something a little bit different going forward? You know, I don't know. My siblings would probably say that I was really more sensitive. I, I, I could feel mom's pain. Some people have um, even a counselor that I went to one time says to me that I am an empath. So I feel deeply other people's pain. So I would sometimes take so much of mom's pain. I was trying to be a rock for her sometimes, right. even as a child. And back in those days, sometimes, you know, you went, you had to do some things where you had to scold the children. And mom would have all this stress of working. And then we'd work a part-time job with her too, as we got older to help her make ends meet. She was cleaning an office. And I can remember one time when she had to scold us and I went to her and apologized that she had to scold us because the stress that we were putting on her made me feel sad for her. So I'd say I always was kind of trying to be in my own small way, a little rock for my mama. <laughs> what was the and home? when it comes to the sisters, I mean, I love them all. We all have different relationships. I don't think there was one in particular when I was younger that I, that I went to, but we all looked up to my oldest sister. Okay. Because she was my oldest sister and I loved her. Is she, is she still close to you right now, your oldest sister? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Our family's close. Absolutely. Yes. My oldest sister just, um, she's, she's become, with age even, more of a rock for me. She's truly been, I've been through some things in my life, and she's been there for me. And we've all been there for each other. I mean, all families have their ups and downs, et cetera, but you can't take away the love. And we're still there for each other. When you talk about you know, childhood, and, and this is the month that we're dealing with a lot of issues. We're dealing with um, child abuse, we're dealing with mental illness, we're dealing with uh, domestic violence. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But you know what's so funny, Angela? A lot of the things that we deal with, that we're dealing with now, believe it or not, I'm, I'm not a therapist. However, I did stay at the Best Western Hotel. <laughs> 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 but they all they all seem to transpire from our childhood. So with that happening to y your parents as a child, what was going through your head? Oh, man. I just remember because as you know, you had sort of a you know, I, I can say honestly, and sometimes we try to keep the private things too private, and that doesn't help anybody understand us and understand the obstacles we've overcome to get where we were. But my father came from a, a line of alcoholics, and it's it's a real problem for many families. His, his dad, his brother, a sister, I mean, we had alcoholism in the family. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really disruptive environment with that kind of um, uh, an addiction. And I know it now. I didn't understand it so much when I was little, but I understand he had a disease and I love my daddy. He's not with us anymore. He actually suffered some long-term damage from his years of alcoholism, but he quit drinking in his forties, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And we were able to finally have the relationship that we wanted with him. And he was a wonderful granddad. And we just he broke our hearts when we lost him, but he ended up getting another 20 years because he found a way to stop now, mom and dad were divorced and we were leaned more on mom and had more of a relationship with her because he was fighting his illness and his disease. But it was a volatile household sometimes just from the dynamics of having somebody dealing with a disease. Um, and so you ask me what I would say. I would ask people to hold on. And if you and your family have some issues like so many of us do with addiction, with alcoholism, with substance abuse, do what you can to help that person. 
don't get mad at them. Don't act like, you know, there's something horrible about them. Right. No, they're sick. They're sick. So I would just tell people to, to try to work with that family member, get them the help that they need, get, get them to the Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever meetings that they might be able to go to and do your best to pour into them because the opioid epidemic is real and a lot of families are dealing with that too. Yeah, we talked about that. Do what you can that. to help them. Now, take me down to your career. Mm-hmm. Dallas, Channel 13, Channel 6. Uh, with these things that you w- went through, and the people need to understand, when you're dealing with things as a child and you you tapped on it, we keep it internally, and they really don't show their faces until usually we're in a crisis or we put into a crisis. But clearly mm-hmm. you kept a lot of that stuff inside, but you were still able to navigate. So now you're going to college and you're starting your life. So tell me about that. Yeah, I went to college in part. I mean, I just wanted us to have a better life. I wanted to be able to help my mom. I think I had mentioned that to you because she worked so hard to Mm -hmm. take care of us. And so I knew if I got a degree, that would open up more doors for me. I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly, but I knew I needed a college degree to be able to help her somehow. And so I actually changed my major. I ended up studying communications in the end, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Long story short, I was always a writer at heart. I wrote songs and I wrote poetry and all that kind of thing. So I leaned toward, I was watching TV news and I thought, I'm going to go write commercials. And I sang. <laughs> I sang gonna... and I, as I said, I wrote songs, uh-huh. I sang, and I thought, I'm going to go to a TV station, get an internship and work in production <laughs> oh, in the commercial okay. end, promotions end, and write commercial jingles. For I didn't know what I was doing, but what the heck. <laughs> write commercial jingles, write commercials, do promotions, that kind of thing. Right. I walked into the newsroom, they gave me an internship, and within a week or two, they pulled me out of the department that I wanted to work in, which I was not even, I think it was shorter than that now that I think about it. The news director came to me and said he wanted me in the newsroom. I was like, why? I, I had no interest in news. Right. But at the time they were looking for racial minorities and I'm an African-American woman. And so they saw some potential in seeing what I would do during that internship. Fell into a story by accident. Long story short, they ended up putting intern Angela Kane on TV doing a story. Right. I wrote well. Right. And at the end, he brought me in and he asked me if I wanted to be on TV and be a reporter. I was like, why? Don't ever do that in the job interview. I literally said to the news director, why? Because I had no interest right. in being on TV. Long story short, he, um, I got myself together. I said, yes, I was scared to death. I used to shake. You could see my little microphone shaking when I did a stand up. <laughs> I was nervous. But ultimately, I feel like, OK, God, you opened up that door for a reason. And I followed it into a 30 year career. I started in Dayton and then I got a job offer to come to um, Indianapolis, and I think you told some of my background. Each time, let me tell you something. Tell me. Sometimes we don't understand our own gifts that that we have been given because I believe that everybody has a unique, unique talent. Mine is not any more special than anyone else's. And and no matter where you come from, you can build your dream. And so here I am getting this chance to leave after two years in TV news. And I wasn't even sure I wanted to do it anymore because I was the crime beat reporter for the last year, telling all kinds of bad news. And it kind of hurt this empath's heart. But I got this opportunity to leave, not because I was looking, but a competitive news director wanted to get me out of town and sent my tape to Indianapolis to a news director there. News director called me, offered me a great double my salary. Of course, I'm going to go. Right. I go to town and find out that this competitive news director, he called me up actually. He said, Angie, you know, I tried to get you out of town because I see a bright um, future for you here. and We don't want the competition. Same thing happened to me when I moved to Indianapolis. I was there six years. I was a weekend anchor. And all of a sudden I had an agent at some point because I wanted to see what opportunities were out there for me for the future. And I got an offer in the fifth biggest TV market in the country, TV news market, that is. I mean, there are some 200 plus rated TV news markets. And so I went, they hired me. And when I went to the job interview in Dallas, leaving Indianapolis, he said, you know how you got here, don't you? I said, my agent, I assume my agent had made the connection. He wasn't going to tell me because he wanted to take full responsibility. Right. <laughs> but, but he said, this news director in Dallas, well, you got hear from the competitive news director at Channel 8 in town, Wish TV's news director, and he saw me years later, told me, as as did this news director, that he sent my tape to Dallas to get me out of town because they felt that I was a, you know, I had some talents that could take away some of their audiences. I don't know. I never see myself that way. But it was a compliment that both of my jobs were competitive news directors sending me out of town. What do you think, what do you think that, that the competitive stuff was that they were talking about? You know, did, did that, did that even 
come across you to say, what, what is the competition? Who am I going up against? Did you even think about that? You know, I don't live my life like that. So I have never looked at the competition to see if I can be better than, or it's not that I can't learn from people. If I see somebody good, I, I like that. I'm like, oh, they do a really right. good job kind of thing. But here's the best advice I ever got in my life and career. And it came from my mom. And some of it is my faith, my belief too, that we think that, you know, we all have our unique skills. Why be jealous of anyone else? Right. But mom said to me when I was on TV in Dayton and I was scared to death, as I told you, I had not even wanted to be on air. And I was trying to sometimes talk like, how, what's a journalist sound like? You know, I mean, it was just crazy. <laughs> and mom could see me and mom said to me, Angie, just be yourself. Cause most, my family calls me Angie, just be yourself. Right. People advice. But it was the life changing kind of thing that helped me go through my career, never worrying about what everybody else is doing, but always just trying to be the best me I could be. <laughs> you know, I can't be somebody else, but I can be the best me I can be. And I always operate from my heart. So even when I'm nervous, even when I was in that big market and there were times in Dallas where I was on the news desk one time for 15, 16 hours straight doing when the Oklahoma City bombing happened, right. aging myself here. And I had no script, nothing. And I'm sitting with my co-anchor. We didn't have any scripts. And we had to talk 15, 16 hours straight with nothing but this, like I have an earphone in my ear now, right. nothing but an earphone in our ear to the producer back in another room telling us the chopper is over the scene. And then we would just talk about what we saw. And then they would start putting experts in our ears. They were finding some domestic terrorists and, you know, Right. Uh, worldwide terrorist experts, I should say, not not the terrorists, but the experts that we would all of a sudden say, Angie, you have Dr. Blank Blank from this university on the phone. The producer would tell me in my ear. And then all of a sudden I'm talking to that doctor and I'm interviewing that doctor, or this professor about terrorism for the next half hour, me and my co-anchor. We literally didn't leave that desk for 14, 16 hours. So you have to learn to have a confidence in yourself and a comfort in who you are. And that was rooted into me, I'd have to say, from my mama. <laughs> you know, the It doesn't mean that we always do well. It doesn't mean that we don't have failures along the way. But I always know in my life and my career, and I tell this to anyone, don't compare yourself to other people. Be happy with you. Just be the best you you can be because it's it really tears you apart when you're trying to be something you're not. And I think that's probably what came through for me as a news anchor, whatever TV stations I went to and why news directors saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself. It's that I'm authentic. Right. <laughs> what you see with me is what you get. Did sometimes it's pretty, sometimes it's not. And I really care. I care about people. And I feel like I was put in the camera on camera jobs because I never really wanted, I wanted to tell other people's, I wanted other people to shine. But people along the way saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. And that's how I also ended up being, you know, in TV news. But I always just wanted to use whatever platform I had to serve, to help people. So did figure color, out what your purpose is. Did, and color, do did color ever come into your, your, your mind in, in this market? Because clearly mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of African-Americans on in, in your in your field at that time did that play no. how did you adjust to that you know it's interesting because i i they actually had removed someone from the anchor desk the only african-american anchor in at channel six at the time and a legend <laughs> and i'll just leave it at that but that's the i wasn't even interested in being a news anchor i was still reporting i'd only been there about a year and a half maybe right. and all of a sudden i think they were getting as i recall protests and things that basically um, led them to have to try to find somebody to put up on that desk. <laughs> right, right, right. And I was the only other black woman at the time. And so they came to me and said, Angie, do you want to anchor? I'm like, well, I never have done that before, but okay. And I was green around the gills, but yes, color came into my life a few different times because I, um, I definitely, it, Did you it, experience it's one of those the things good? where you're replacing people because of protests and you're hired in part because they need you too as well. So you so, experienced the good, the bad and the ugly with, with that. And if so, can you share with the viewers what those good and bad and uglies was in your in your career? Because you just said the first or the African-American. So you had to deal with some type of adversities and how if you did what were those adversities and how did you overcome them and, and to keep moving the way you're moving right now huh yeah i think i'm one of those people who doesn't try to dwell in the negative so i have to kind of get my thoughts back on that i'm sorry i'm having a, a 
my phone tipped over there, my son, sister calling me. And I always think, is there an emergency going on? Because she kept calling, but she's calling someone else now. Okay. But just back to what we were saying. Um, yeah, I can say, oh my gosh, how can I forget this? This is something I blogged about. When I first started in Dayton, Ohio, I'm just going to call it like it is. I worked with a woman photographer at the time mm -hmm. who did not like that I was hired in part because she felt it was I was black. And I can remember riding around with her. Here I am not even sure I wanted to be on TV. I was still nervous. You know, I, I was scared a little bit to be in front of that camera and mm -hmm. trying to just be live. And, you, you know, this was all new to me. She would go. She turned to me one day in the car where she was driving with me and said, why is it that all black people are uneducated and on welfare? What? Yes. I said, what? <laughs> now, I'm not a, a shrinking butterfly. So, right, of course, I'm right. pushing back on her. What are you talking about? That's really an uneducated thing to say. I can't believe you said that. Why? You know, and so I pushed back and she kind of laid off. She became my I mean, she was after me. She has she was she was racist. That's just the bottom line. At one point, when I would get ready to do a stand up, I was holding the camera and because I was newer, I remember my microphone, as I said, shaking sometimes. She knew that I had a little bit of, you know, still trying to figure out how to be a reporter kind of way to me. But right. I still had a lot of natural talent. So I was not an embarrassment by any stretch. But before I would do a stand up, she would say things literally. Do you know you look like shit today? Where'd you get those clothes from a thrift shop? Yes. This was my main photographer I went out with. And I, I've sat on that story for a lot of years, but I won't do that anymore. I can look and at I'm your like, face and see. She would make me nervous before yeah. I did my stand up. What was that? I can look at your face and see now that this is this is really impact because you kept it in. And now it's kind of like I can, <laughs> I can look at you and see what's going on. I, I actually, for the first time in all these years, about a year ago or so, I wrote a blog about things that held me back, but I overcame them. And that's when that's the way came rushing back. But I still find out, I, this is the first time I've ever talked about it out loud to anyone publicly. And finally, one day she walked into the newsroom. They had hired, uh, they, they had another intern who was a white woman. She was pretty. She was, she seemed to do a nice, a good job from what I could see. Mm -hmm. We had no problems, me and this intern. And she walked, this intern walked into the room, it was a weekend. And she looked at her and she literally said to me, oh, I feel like I want to cry going back to these times. Go ahead. Go she, ahead. She, she looked at me, her, and she said, and then she looked at me and she said, I wish they'd have hired a good woman like her, not an N-word. I don't want to say it. Not an N like you. That's what she said to me. And I literally stood in that newsroom and I was like, okay, Angie. Remember your Christianity because I about ready to lose it on her. She had been picking me, tearing me apart for six months quietly. And I was afraid as a new kid on the block to go in there and complain about this photographer who'd been there for maybe about a decade at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, will they believe me? Will they believe her? Will I lose my job? I, I had fear. Don't ever fear. Don't ever let anybody take away your voice, people. I'm telling you, I'm passionate about this. Stand up for yourself. And I have done that. Even in that moment, what happened was a black photog a black reporter walked in at the same time. This is a weekend, smaller crew, black uh, timing was good. He walks into the room and he looked at me and he could see me welling up with tears, with emotion, because I'm like, what do I do with her? I'm ready to go outside and settle this. And I don't fight. I mean, right, but I didn't right. know what to do with this moment where she just called me an N word. And so he came over and he pulled me aside. He could tell something was going on. He talked to me and he settled me down. And he said, I will walk into that news director's office with you the next day. This was a weekend and we will tell this story. And I had planned on doing it anyway, but it was just good to have that support of right. a colleague, an African-American man, <laughs> right. you know, who saw the pain I felt, who experienced the pain I felt, who felt it too. But and Angela, what, real, go ahead. real quick, <laughs> Sorry, she's, been there, she's, been, she's been there for 10 years. You mean to tell me this couldn't have been an isolated incident? So they, somebody in that department had to know what was going on. You, you may be right. I, here's, the, here's the odd thing. It would not have happened like it did then. The news director calls me in and, and he, well, not calls me, and he said he'd listen to me and the photographer, the reporter friend was with me. I told him what had been happening. It had been, a, it had been obsessively going on for six months, trying to hurt my self-esteem, 
calling me, saying very racist things to me, me pushing back at her, trying to make me feel bad, all these things. And he said, oh, that's terrible. I'm going to go ahead and separate her from you. Basically, they just made sure she never worked with me again, and they put it on her file. And she continued there, literally retired in the last few years, 20-some years, 30 years past. She continued. And, and you Today, know, that would not have happened, I don't think. And, and you, know what's, you know what's funny? It, uh, and people are wondering. This is this is this is some serious stuff, and mm -hmm. I'm glad you're sharing that with us because that's 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 that beast frame of mind to know that you don't have to come with violence. No, I would and, never. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but you you came back with an as a strong, intelligent woman. But the but the tripped out part about this whole scenario is, people always ask, "What's going on with the world?" This is what's going on with the world. It's been going on forever, and we've been sweeping it up yes. under the rugs and afraid to to say because I you don't want to lose your job, but you don't know who to trust either during the, during this time, and we're still doing it to this to this day. And I'm oh. I'm I'm sorry that happened. I'm glad you shared that story with us too. But on a lighter note, on a lighter note. You bought your mom a house. You, you became successful. You you <laughs> went over this adversity with 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 strongness, with beast mentality. I you, like you, that. Yeah, you, you, yeah. You, I was able to help my mom put a I put a down payment on her home, and me and another sister, and get her started and get her her first home. She'd never had a home in her life, and it helped her go into retirement. I was also able to help her financially off and on. You know, even when I was just out of college. So I just. I mean, I love my mama. <laughs> Who of us doesn't? We all want to sometimes do things to help those we love. Right, that's right. that's really more important to me than anything. And then you're right. I, I I never thought about it to you, Andre, but I guess there is a beast mentality, that fighter in me that says, and my belief that says, nobody is any better than me and I'm no better than anybody else. I cannot let another person define me. I define myself. Mm -hmm. And I say that to anybody. You know, I've carried that with me wherever I go. Be yourself. Don't let anybody else tell you who you are. And my mother raised us that way to stand up for ourselves. You know what? You're doing something even more impact, in, impacting the people. You started a, a um, not only started, but you're doing something to address even a bigger issue, the issue mm -hmm. of uh, domestic violence, the issues of child abuse. But wait before we go there. We ain't going to go there because you tapped on something that's going to probably put a smile on your face. Okay. You wrote songs. But you wrote a song. Yep, we can go there. Uh oh. <laughs> you okay. wrote you wrote for someone pretty famous. Can you share that with us before we go down the other other area? Oh gosh, that was my other little side thing, my side gig. I would have songs in my head, and I would just take out my four piece recorder, and I I record myself singing three four part harmony. Right. So you'd hear all the music, the melody, and everything, and I just did it one as a hobby. Right. But. I miss it was a missed opportunity actually it's Dallas 1999 I would say I was a news anchor I was very busy but I had a colleague in the newsroom who liked to sing right. and he did country music so he asked me to write a few country songs I never really thought about it but I'm a, I'm a songwriter okay. so I wrote a couple of country songs and then I wrote some R&B which was really more my heart and I just on a lark sent them off to an A&R representative at Columbia Sony Rec Records back in Dallas at the time right. but what the heck throw my little cassette tape in with me singing about three R&B <laughs> songs four part <laughs> harmony i never expected to hear anything they say you end up in this long pile forget about it right she heard something in me she ended up calling me up and she said huh you got something here i'd like for you to get with a musician a pianist or something like that in in the studio and work out some of these songs and i was like in shock i think the fact that the door opened was enough for me i don't know <laughs> you know <laughs> like, you know what i'm gonna I, you know i'm gonna do angela i'm i'm me and jason are gonna no. find out how to get you on the voice or guess who the mystery no. singer is. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't sing anymore, but I'll tell you who this group was. Guess who the mystery was? Who was that? This was a young group being just starting start they were just being nurtured in the market. It was Destiny's child and what? Jessica Simpson who was new in the Dallas market too. Beyonce! Uh, Beyonce, Destiny's here. Child. Get and I never here. followed through. <laughs> Just wasn't my journey. Well, you know, what? I'm going to make sure they get a copy of this, this this tape right here and, 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 and hear what you just said. No. 
but that's right but it was a, it was quite a moment and then i also had the chance really quickly to do potentially backup <clears throat> singing for uh, ray charles but i was just going to college and i had a, a mission to not go traveling across the world but to get a college degree to help my family so i said you know i wasn't interested when they came at me so tell us about the the programs and the foundations and the organizations that you are a part of and that you help mentor with a more serious issue and definitely you're a part of that because you're about giving and feeling you already said that when we first opened up you, you like to take that pain and try to figure out how to heal it to some degree and you've done this by addressing two key components that we're dealing with today, which is child abuse and domestic mm -hmm. violence. Share with the viewers exactly your role there and what some of the things that you've done to bring awareness to these topics. Well, I actually, I was in Dallas for about eight years. They were trying to get me to sign a longer term contract. It was a great opportunity. And I literally walked away from TV news with a chance at the time, even with somebody interested in me at the cable news, national news network. And I said goodbye to it because I was not in my purpose. I just felt like what matters most? Get this one beautiful life. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to keep telling people just the bad news? No, right. I didn't. So I walked away and I was out of TV for a couple of years. I worked for a TV ministry. I only got back to become the community affairs director at Channel 13 over all the campaigns that serve people, that help people like right. Coats for Kids, Race for the Cure. And then they also let me create the campaign you're talking about, Shattering the Silence. And this was a 12-year campaign I led at Channel 13 on domestic abuse and child abuse, Shattering the Silence on it, giving people hope, resources for help, telling them where to go for shelters, giving them numbers. We did PSAs. I did a bunch of news series profiling those who survived so that they could encourage others to understand love is not hurting if people are hurting you if they're controlling you if they're taking power over you that's not love and it was such a blessing to be able to continue that message for a 12-year campaign i did a t couple of tv hour pro i produced and wrote hour-long tv specials a few of them hour long half hour long and i can remember this is why i felt like god put me in TV news, not because I really cared about being seen. I've never cared. I was never skinny enough or never this or that. You know, so <laughs> what I cared about was being able to help people. And that campaign, I can remember getting some stats the first year we did it. They had like a 75% jump in calls to the domestic abuse hotlines in the summertime when we would capitalize on that campaign. And so that's where you see impact. And the thing that still touches my heart mm, is a story that I did, and it was with a woman, and, and, so, and abuse happens on all socioeconomic levels, from poor to rich to preachers to, I mean, doctors, you know, you name it. People have been abused or are abusers. And this woman saw one story that I did with a professional woman who said she finally realized love was not hurting and got out of an abusive relationship. That story, and this is where stories matter, Andre, that story touched this woman so much she had been in an abusive physically abusive relationship for 35 years, 35 years. That's a long she time. She called a shelter and she said, I want to leave. They had, they were so afraid of her abuser that they ended up giving her a wireless cell phone, sent her to another state to go into shelter. And she called them from this cell phone they'd given her in case she needed them for anything. And she said, I'm free. I'm finally free. I don't know why that just gets me for some reason. That's all because right. That's the impact of what we can do when we have a voice. I've never felt that I have a voice for any other reason than to serve. But this woman left a 35 year abusive relationship because of a story she saw that spoke to her that I wrote from this other woman. People understand each other's pain. How and so she... that campaign was really, really critical to me. For th 12 years, we were able to help people. How is she doing now? Do you still have you have you no, heard they, they don't from... identify. They don't identify. They're not allowed to. That was just, they called me up and they let me know, but I can't trail anyone. That was, that was private information. I would like, to, I want to believe that she never went back. <laughs> And I know that there are others like that as well. And you can get help and you can find hope and you can even try to get the person who's being abusive to you to counseling. But ultimately, the only thing you can control is yourself and you deserve to be loved. Don't stay in a relationship where you are not loved well. We talked about something that I guess we can talk about briefly. We, mm -hmm. The fact that when you're dealing with domestic abuse and domestic violence, mm -hmm. Men also go through that. I, I am I am a surviving victim of dem, uh, victim of domestic violence, uh, mm -hmm. both physically, mentally, and verbally. 
you can get over you can get over the 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 physical aspect and like i shared with you the hardest part for me was getting over the verbal part of it and it's funny what uh the men we we don't like to come forward with with that because it's it's unheard of for that to happen in in it for for men but it does happen i think a lot of us men live that code of silence and don't want to reach out but it it i'm speaking for myself it hurts and i'm a big supporter of making sure that this doesn't happen to anyone whether it be male female child whatever it <laughs> you got to be able to take i think the biggest thing was what you said and with support of family and friends that that really saw what was going on and mm-hmm. I knew what was going on. I just had to make that decision to say this isn't healthy. You know, I'm to, so glad. Yeah. So I, I I appreciate the fact that you have a foundation to, that 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 addresses that. I would encourage individuals to 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 know that there is help out there. You know, yes. you don't have to walk and down I, the path I, alone. I actually just wanted to interrupt and to Go say ahead. I don't have a foundation, although you're making me think about getting one <laughs> because Go I'm right reminded ahead. what a big problem it is. <laughs> but I, I did that for 12 years at Channel 13, and they ended up eliminating my community affairs department. So that campaign ended as well when I left. But it's still a passion of mine. And I've really been thinking about doing more with it on this other side because now I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own Angela Kane Communications, PR, media relations, brand storytelling kind of business. But I'm really just trying to tap more into to what I can do to serve. And I'm helping nonprofits. So that's that was my reason for really even shaping the Angela Kane Communications to help them tell their story. You're talking to me. More people need to hear you, people like you, Andre, talking about it. Men are afraid to come up, come forward and say things. I interviewed some men who were abused. They feel as if that makes them look weak. No, you're strong to stand up and say, I'm not going to be treated like this. And yeah. to also not react and 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 yeah, hurt as, somebody else in that takes a lot yeah, for a man the, to be yeah. able to hold themselves back and mm-hmm. not react. Right. So in a negative way. I'm proud of you. That's all I'll say. Thank you. So tell me about the uh, Angela Communications and, and and its role in helping individuals stay in that beast frame of mind. You, you, I see you put all of your energy into this. <laughs> you got to share it with us and tell us exactly how, what, how it works and, and its impact towards people. Yeah, I, with me, I, I, because I was the community affairs director, I used to do a segment at Channel 13 called Focus on one of the shows every day, weekday. And I focused on all the ways the community can get help, the nonprofits that are available if you're going through tough times, financial times, abusive situations, whatever. And I poured so much of my heart into helping promote those nonprofits so people would support them, volunteer for them, and also so you could go get help. But I always knew when my career ended in media, I had to continue to serve. And so I, I did step away for a year and a half. I was the public affairs and community affairs uh, overall communications and marketing person at the Indianapolis Airport Authority. But that was just to get my daughter out of college. I needed to sort of fund the last child out of a blended family into college. And then I did what I always knew I was going to do. Before I even left Channel 13, I went to the Indy Chamber and I took an entrepreneurship class. I knew that's where I was going because I wanted to continue to serve. And I have a heart for nonprofits who I used to do MC dozens and dozens of events for nonprofits. And I would often have to write the scripts for their events because they didn't have anybody to do it. So I wanted to try to find a way to tell their story through public relations, through media relations, media training, storytelling. And I've been doing a lot of work with them, marketing videos to help tell their story. Man, I mean, I feel so good. One of the stories, for example, is stories that I've been doing for a, a, a health foundation. They used one of the stories at a dinner and I've done it now for three years. And every time they show the story, the first year in particular, they showed the story they had hoped to raise, let's say I'm going to make up a number, $20,000 that night to try to get some mental health services for this nonprofit. And they doubled the amount they hoped to raise because in part of that story that touched people and made them want to give stories engage us. Stories make us care. Stories make people donate. Stories help support charitable organizations. And that's still my heart. Mm. I've been doing some other things as well because I've had some others outside of nonprofit um, come to me, but I'm really loving helping nonprofits. 
Heck, I helped a political candidate. I did a lot of media <laughs> training and debate prep. I've never done politics before, right, but right. you know, I'm just really passionate about um, certain things and taking action and standing up against abuse, even all the way to the top. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, if it's even you know, the top of the nation, I'm going to stand up. So you mentioned the kids going off to college. So tell me about Angela Kane, the mother, Angela Kane, the, the, the wife. Share, you know, tell me how you keep that household going. Oh, we're all, all of our kids are out in the world now. But I, I went from one to five children, but they were preteen and teen and moving on and all the dynamics. Of, I married a widower, so there's still pain that they deal with that I know I could never um, repair. But right. all I can do is love and do what we can to get them out into the world. And all of our daughters are out in the world doing their things. They all have jobs. They all went to college or graduated, um, have a couple of master's degrees in there too. Right. And they're all doing quite well. And that's all we can do. Now let them live their life journey. But, you know, I mean, I had the the one daughter by birth who, who is um, I'm pouring into as she goes through some life change and I'm, and I've had her home. She's been oh, several places, right. but now she's home resetting during COVID-19 and I'm trying to keep her here. Right. Right. I'm going to ask two more questions before we wrap up. Sure. If I'm going I'm to address this question to you, we're going through so much right now. And I usually ask all my guests this, we're going through so much. And right now we need, leaders. We need people that's been through things. We need people that's seen things. If you had to share some wisdom moving forward to the masses out there, what would you share with the viewers? Wow, that's a deep question. I can tell you this. I've been broken hearted about how politics have divided us over the last four years in particular just broken hearted. I think all of us, sometimes you just get so frustrated and you feel angry and you feel hurt and you want to be able to heal it. And you can't heal other people's pain, but you can try to figure out how to heal what's around you and yourself. And my advice would be, here, here's what I saw. Let me just backtrack very briefly. When I was covering nonprofits, when I'm doing a Coats for Kids event, thousands of people would show up to get coats and we would have hundreds of volunteers. And I never cared while we we're getting these volunteers, whether you were a Republican, I didn't care if you were a Democrat. I didn't care if you were apolitical. I just cared about the fact that you cared. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to people, stop letting our politics define us, figure out what our common humanity is. Nobody cares about, you know, necessarily what, whether you have this D or this R or, or L, they care about how we care. Stop forgetting what we have in common. Stop forgetting what matters most. What matters most is that we all have so much more in common. Like we love our families. We want our children to have opportunities no matter what your race. We want to live our best life while we're here and we want our children to live their best life while they're here. Are you pouring into the world something positive? Are you trying to understand and see people where they are even when you don't agree? And sometimes you can't. And sometimes you have to separate yourself as someone is really bringing you down with the way that they're treating you or, or making you feel or you know, I'm not saying you need to stay in relationships that are not good for you, even sometimes in your families, but don't shut the door without first trying to understand each other. Try to understand each other. Find out what you have in common. See if there's a solution to some of the problems. And if there's not, then you make decisions that keep you healthy. Don't become someone that gets walked on. Mm. <laughs> but at the same time, collectively, I say to the nation, get back to who we are. We all are mothers and fathers, or if not, we're people who have loved ones and we want to just live our best lives. How can you help somebody live their best life? Not by fussing at them, yelling at them, separating yourselves from each other. Jeez, we get this one life, one beautiful life on this earth. How do you want it to look? And if it's not looking positive and uplifting for each other's spirits and for other spirits, how can you change it? How can you make a difference? How can you even change within if you need to? Life is too short. I'm sorry. Don't you got me started there, Andre? <laughs> hey, that's what I'm the show is about, about getting it. people passionate and staying in that brief frame of mind. Let me ask the I, last. Go okay. ahead. You got to go ahead. Go ahead. Say it. Share it. No, no. I just I couldn't hear you. I was just going to oh. say, what was that? <laughs> how can our viewers reach you for public speaking? How can they know more about you? Do we have a website up, Jason, for her? I think he stuck something up earlier. It's Angela Kane. My name is Angela Kane with no E, C-A-I-N communications 
communications.com. That's my website, communications.com. But it's really easy too to just email me and you'll find that information on my website, which I need to update, by the way. I was saying <laughs> I'm in the middle of changing it. But you can reach me at Angela at Angela King Communications for dot com for an email angela at angela king communications dot com just remember my name throw communications on the end <laughs> dot com you got me through email too that sounds like what angela you know it is definitely an honor having you on the show uh thanks for agreeing to be on the show and sharing your story that was truly impact impactful to um the viewers um and you're right we need to stay out of toxic situations we need to uh uh, stay healthy, and more importantly, we need to sh we need to do what you said on your on your website. What's your story? And that's what this is about. This is about that beast frame of mind, you know, and showing that even when you're down, you still got to have that beast Ooh. mentality to keep moving Ooh. forward. Because if not, you you're unhealthy. If if that happens to you, yes. but even if you do find yourself being unhappy or or you can't get out, there are people out there that has walked the same walk there's there are organizations and services out there that can help you get back into that beast frame of mind you know and i'll just quickly say love yourself i just posted something on my facebook page in the last couple of weeks and it's and it, i have to speak to myself sometimes too because we pour too much in others and sometimes forget ourselves know your worth don't like let that. anybody take away your love of yourself. Love yourself, it helps you love others better. And when you love yourself, you won't, you'll get away from things when they're not taking care of you, when they're not hurting you, or you'll seek help for them and you. But love yourself and know your worth, always. And with that said, I'm gonna let Angela close off with that powerful closing. Thank you, Angela, for being on the show. This has been the Andre the Beast Show. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.